it, it's very present in the education system. I mean, and we see this with like, there's something called the achievement gap for those that don't know, essentially black and brown kids score lower on standardized tests and reading comprehension and stuff like that um, than like white and Asian kids. And the, the solution is to look into why mm -hmm. and then fix the problem from the why. Cause the why is two things. It's one, it's, it's that they're just not capable. Black, brown and black kids just can't do this stuff, which is not like true. a foundational idea of racism that is clearly not true. <laughs> Okay. And then the other one is the, is the idea that there's something off. It could be within family. It could be within culture, it could mm -hmm. be within education, whatever it is. But once you point out, once you recognize it's the second one, then you go out and you say like, well, they can't jump over these hurdles. It's like, get them stronger legs. You don't lower yes. the hurdle. Yes. How is that going to serve them in any kind of way throughout their life? Now you're just going to lower the bars. Because you actually love what you do. That's, yeah. that's the whole point. Why would, yeah. yeah, I don't get to do it. Like, why are teachers doing countdowns to summer? Like, what does that tell the message to the kids? You know what I mean? Absolutely. Well, that's probably a good place to start. Well, Will Roosh is here. If you guys don't know who he is, he's kind of changing the game when it comes to education. It's flipping it's on its head. And you're giving a voice to parents, I find, that are really struggling with the education system, really, really struggling with the teacher's mentality, as we were just kind of briefly alluding to, whether it's the large amount of holiday, the three months off or the Christmas breaks or the March breaks, or I don't know how much more time off you need. Well, you will, you will genuinely stop complaining about your job. I'm a big believer. If you don't love what you do, go do something else. But if you're going to take it out on students and parents for saying, Hey, why do you have more days off than work? And then you complain, I have a hard time with it. And I know people say I'm insensitive and you don't have to deal with what teachers have to deal with. No, cause I chose not to, cause I, because life is a choice. I made the choice, different choices. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I mean, a lot of people fall into education because other things didn't work out. That cliche of those who can't do teach, I've seen that many, many, many times. Hmm. Not me, like I knew that I wanted to do this like halfway through college. So that's all I got secondary ed, social studies was my, my major. And then that's all I've done. And I don't look forward to summer breaks, as I said. Like I don't look forward to vacations. Like it's nice to get a break every once in a while, but you get a lot of them. It's, it's like, I don't get to do the thing that I love to do for, for three months. It doesn't make sense, which is part of why I started like social media and stuff. It's just, I'm just obsessed with learning and teaching and explaining things and, and everything like that. So I I'm, I'm with you. So let's get right into it. I found out about you through a mutual friend, a uh, friend named Candace, and I just fell in love with your interview. I re-listened to it again, actually this morning, because I was trying to, what I realize about Candace and, and I have now, you know, no, starting to know her quite well mm -hmm. is that she's an incredibly brilliant, well-read individual and trying to hold the candle to her when it comes to education is quite difficult because she is as well-read as she sounds and you yeah. are as well. And I found it really interesting. Uh, and, and forgive me if I, if I'm wrong on this, do you, did you, do you teach at a Jewish school? I do. So for the past, I mean, almost decade or decade, I've taught at a modern Orthodox Jewish school. Okay. Yeah. Before that, yeah. I was teaching in East LA in like, like one of, if not the worst neighborhood in, in LA. So I went like, it's, it's quite a, quite a leap. Yeah, it is quite a leap. And I want to get into that. But more importantly, if, if people haven't listened to the episode with Candace, or they haven't listened to any of your social media platforms, uh, because you do have uh, a couple now, and you are pushing on all fronts in terms of the marketing for your online program, which we'll get into. Do you want to give everyone an overview of who you are and why you stepped out uh, to be a more of a public face on this on these topics? Yeah, out. I heard the Canadian come out. Um, Don't start. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, so I, uh, I graduated from Penn State. I grew up in Pennsylvania. I graduated from Penn State with a degree in secondary education. Moved out to LA just because, like, the beach and the weather and everything like that is beautiful. Got a job at uh, a public charter school, then another public charter school, and then ended up at this modern Orthodox Jewish school. So I've been a teacher, a classroom teacher in social science. So I've taught all areas of social studies, from sociology, psychology world history, American history, civics, government, economics, all that kind of stuff over the years to really diverse audiences. Like, you know, I've had students who are, you know, gangbangers. I've had 17 year old mothers of three. I've had, you know, ankle bracelets on all that kind of, I got wild stories from the hood, like wild. Whoa. Um, and then now, and then I've taught like also like A-list celebrities, kids and stuff like that too. So I've really got a, 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 a good view of like all of LA, but in about 2015 or so, um, uh, the stuff that was happening with Brett Weinstein, uh, Nick Christakis, and Jordan Peterson got on my radar. This idea of like 
for lack of a better term, this like woke kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I go, oh, I know what that is. I've been in education. I know what that is. I've seen it in K through 12, specifically high school. Let me find the high school teachers that are that are speaking out against this, the way that like the intellectual dark web, as like Eric Weinstein called it, was speaking out. And there weren't any. No one in K through 12 education was speaking out about it. So I go, that's ridiculous. So I started talking about it in my class. My wife does like online marketing. She said, why don't you start a social media platform? I was like, no one wants to hear this. She's like, well, give it a shot. Because I was ta talking about the stuff I was doing in class, challenging, you know, critical thinking stuff. So I started an Instagram in 2018, a podcast in 2019, and just trying to try, trying to model how to do good education across tech and stuff like that. And I've kind of been doing that. And that's been growing. And I got, I've gotten a lot, a lot smarter by getting my ideas challenged and everything like that uh, for the past couple of years. So a couple things. Number one, how old were you when you decided you wanted to be a teacher? 19. Okay, so what brought yeah. you into the idea that you wanted to teach people? Uh, so I wasn't sure. I went in, um, I went to three different colleges, but I, I went into my first one as a, so, a criminal justice major. Okay. So I went in and the first day, the guy who was teaching the class was like a former cop and he was just, it, was, it just rubbed me the wrong way. It's like all the worst cliches about police officers. You know, this is a place of power and you can command people. And, and I was just like, it's like who, like the worst kind of like stereotypes about cops. And I just, I was like, this isn't for me. <laughs> so I was like, all right, so what am I, what am I going to do? I was like, I got to find some sort of, I want to do a service job. I was, that was kind of, I was kind of raised with that kind of ethos. Uh, so I got into education, but it, I didn't figure out why really until much later when people kept asking me that question. And the truth is I knew it, I could do it better than the teachers that I had. I knew it. Here's what it is, Kelsey. It's being smart, being capable is obviously cool. It's cool in the movies and the books. We know that when someone shows up, like, oh, they can do things. They're smart. We, you were just talking about Candace. Like, it's that's that's an, an attractive feature for for human beings is to be, mm -hmm. you know, capable and smart. But the institution that's designed to make us capable and smart is terrible, and it sucks. So I was like, there's such a disconnect here. There, I I got it. I it can't be that hard to do it better than that. And I think that's really what it was. Okay, so let, let's break that down a little bit. You go into these institutions and you're one person. And, mm -hmm. and I'm not discounting one person. I'm a big believer it takes one person to change the world. And we've seen that time and time again. And we've had a multitude of examples over history to show that it takes one person. You can go all the way back to <laughs> biblical times. I went to a Catholic school. I had that shoved down my throat for the majority of my life. Had yeah. zero connection to it. But they do speak in the Bible of this one person, this Jesus that walked the earth, who was able to you know turn bread into, into loaves of bread and fish into a million fish and to help all of these people. So I am a big believer that it is one person that can change the world, but you are up against a highly, well, maybe this is giving them too much credit, a highly sophisticated system that is designed to make students comply, sit mm -hmm. still and dumb them down to dim their light so that they follow the Germanic style of education, which is let's mm -hmm. make factory workers, let's make military members, let's make compliant human beings. How do you, how do you wrestle with that? Because that is something so complex and that is something that has a uh, really deep underbelly that I don't know that, and maybe I'm being nihilistic here, but this is just the system I see at least in Canada right above you. So it feels like you are fighting this battle and I don't mm -hmm. know how you stay optimistic day after day. Yeah. So um, I understand the reason why it is a, comp uh, a compulsory, the compulsory school system is essentially an obedience model. We exchange curiosity for compliance is what I would say. Cause if you think about mm. what makes a good student, there's someone who follows orders and stuff like that. They don't, they don't ask questions. Um, right. But the, the reason it's like that, you know, the, the link between like prisons and, and schools and public schools is like, I've seen like memes about that. It's really wild. Like, Can I stop you for two yeah, seconds please. on that? I'm yeah. sorry, I have a bad habit of interrupting people, but this That's is important. Good. I had this exact conversation with my son's principal at the beginning of the school year. They closed down the only, and I mean the only area that certain age children could play on this jungle gym, right? They, you know, they were bubble proofing it for all the parents of the children that were, you know, getting the kids, hurt. The kid gets hurt on the playground? Yeah, but it was, it's, it's so, it's so close off the ground that if your child's getting hurt off the playground, we need to have a longer conversation about your hand-eye coordination and lack of mobility as a child, not school. Anyway, I digress. I actually measured the local prison's grounds, the grass area, and how much room they have as prisoners. They get more time outside as prisoners doing life and more areas to play than the children in our school system. And she was so blatantly disgusted with that. And the response was not, you're right, we should do something about it. It was, 
no, you're absolutely wrong. We would have, of course, we'd have more than the prisoners. And I laid out the facts and she just could not, she right. could not for the life of her get her ego out and digest it, which was really quite disturbing to me. From an educator. Like th that's, that's exactly Principal. my point. Principal. But she, yeah, I mean, but she's, I mean, she would probably call herself an educator. I mean, she's in that world. Right. And, and it even worse because it's top down. But that's my that, point. That's, that, that's, yeah, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying is like the, the issue is that teachers have this ego about how I'm right. The sage on the stage, like I'm right. I'm the educator. And, and like, I just, I've never thought that like my ego is not connected with being right. My ego is connected with getting to the right answers. Mm -hmm. So if you prove me wrong, I, I, I get rid of that and I update my software to have better ideas. And that, that's just been a, a hack that I've figured out. But the recess issues, my kids, the reason I pulled them out of LA public schools uh, uh, and took them to a different school was because in May of 2022, May 2022, they were social distanced, masked at recess, one recess. Yeah, we're still have psychopaths up here trying to pull it's that. It's so. wild. So we're then I moved into, the school they have now is five recesses. And what? My, I, my boys are like high energy, you know, like young boys, you know, they're like yeah. they're little savages. <laughs> so five recesses. I don't know if you're familiar with John Rady's book, Spark. I haven't really, read really, it, but I am familiar, yes. Yeah, it's really cool. And like, it's so like, it, it aligns with me because I was asking questions at the public school. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you about that, that idea of like free play, you know, Lenore Skenazy mm -hmm. stuff, you know, John Hyde talks about that, like the importance of, of free play. And also the cool thing about their school now is it's, it's like, there's a few adults that are just kind of there to make sure if, in case someone gets hurt, but there aren't like adult refs or anything. It's all just like kids. They have to sort it out amongst themselves, which is really that. healthy. Very healthy. And yeah. that's something that Jordan speaks about and others speak about when it comes to movement and children and especially young boys. Mm -hmm. We're so quick to medicate young boys. We're so quick to say that they're doing something wrong or they have some form of disorder, but we're very reluctant. And again, I, I use my son's example because that's really the one I have. We see individuals and parents that are constantly feeding children very processed, high sugary diets, early hours in the morning, and then handing them over to teachers only to have the teachers respond in kind and say, there's something developmentally wrong. They cannot stay still. We should look at putting them in a separate classroom or medicating them rather than looking at their diet, speaking to the parents and going, there needs to be some form of accountability. So as a teacher in LA, I mean, for God's sakes, people should be praying for you every day. Uh, how do you handle that when you're seeing these children and you're having to deal with these different levels of parents, whether it's uh, misinformation, education, or just lack of all? Um, so I think that the parents know at this point, I have a really good relationship with, with my students and the parents and the administration of my school, which is why I'm, I've been here and why I'm at, I don't know how I ended up at like a modern Orthodox <laughs> Jewish school. I'm not Jewish, but it's been, a, it's been amazing because right. I get into involved in stuff, some stuff when all like the CRT stuff was going on in schools. I did a bunch yes. of tours on Fox news and Glenn Beck and black news tonight and a whole bunch of different things. And you know, people get upset and send letters to the school, you know, and you know how the, I'm a racist, sexist, homophobe or whatever. And my school, my admin was just, they, they, they crumble it up, throw it away. They're like, we know what you're doing. The families love you. It's all good. I think because of my approach, I'm mm, okay. actually curious. If you say that what I'm doing is wrong. I don't, it's like, I ask, I don't ask rhetorical questions. I ask actual questions to help, right. you know, understand it better. And I think that's disarming for people that, that don't, that don't like what I'm doing. So I don't have a lot of issues, but you're talking about meds and stuff like that. I think it's, I, did, I, I asked my students just like, you know, informal, it's like raising hands. I think it's, and they're pretty open about it with me. I think it's like 40 or 50% of, of my students are on some sort of anti-ADHD, anti-anxiety medication. I had a 17 year old girl who, uh, it's, what's, what's cool, Kelsey, is I, I, the first day of school, I pass around a, a calendar and I have lunch with a different student every day. So I don't That's eat the amazing. back of Yeah, I have lunch with my students. So I get to know them and they open up to me and I get to know, it's, it's cool. Um, but there was a 17 year old. She said that she's been on an antidepressant an anti-anxiety and an, an and like an anti uh, or an ADHD, you know, basically like math since she was 12, 12, I believe oh. 12. So her whole brain, you know, is, is developing with these chemicals. And I told her, I was like, you don't actually know what your brain is doing. And it's, it's, it's part of like the affluenza. If you look at like the, the data on who is, who's over medicated and stuff, it wasn't as much of an issue. Maybe it was because it was 10 years ago, but it wasn't as much of an issue in the really poor uh, communities that I, that I serve. It's more in the wealthy community. Which is, okay, so that in itself is, is 
incredibly terrifying to me and I'll tell you a lot of reasons why. Having my own decade experience with heavy pharmaceutical intervention, understanding what it will do. Um, Dr. Gabrielle Lyons speaks to this, a few other individuals, uh, Danielle Kepex speak to this, whether it's birth control or any other medication that's brought into a prepubescent mind and body, what it's doing to the synapses and the chemical makeup of their brain because of the serotonin in the stomach and it erodes the gut health. It absolutely destroys it. And a topic that people don't seem to be discussing because, it, and I can understand, especially if men don't want to have this conversation, is the libido of women when they're put on into an SSRI uh, medication for a long period of time. Because the doctor's handbook is always very clear. We put you on the SSRI, we don't take you off of it. You become a suicide risk if we remove it. Uh, your brain loses its capacity to actually make the serotonin yourself because it's constantly being fed the serotonin, right? So. You're a smart man, so I'm assuming you understand. I'm going to assume that you understand how SSRIs work in the brain. Like the re-up, reuptake, like trying to open it up, like from back yeah, to front, so, right? Yeah, so because what happens really is everyone, you hear this uh, conversation happening time and time again. I'm waiting for my SSRI to kick in. I'm waiting for it to kick in. It never kicks in because that's not what it does. It rations the current amount of serotonin already within the body, which means it's taking what you have and spreading it thin. You're never going to get that kick in any sort of way that they promise you by the doctors that you will feel better, you will get easier in life, you know, you won't have these depressive bouts. But really what we see is the complete opposite. You become incredibly numb to life, feelings, emotions, yeah. ups or downs. You lose your sex drive, which again, I can understand why men don't want to talk about young girls and sex drive. It can come off weird and creepy. I fully understand that, but I can have this conversation, but it, it will erode your libido and cause significant severe damage and is very, very complex to reverse in uh, a female after their, I mean, I was on mine from 19 to, oh, I think 29, 30. Wow. So you right in that time is your peak, your peak for your sex drive, right? And if you are using a drug that numbs you out, you lose that. It doesn't exist. It's the same with head injuries, right? We, we see these things uh, impact that. So when you have a young child who, number one, doesn't know her body because she's never been taught how it works, how it should function, uh, whether that's from the birth control perspective or periods or sex drive or just knowing herself internally to know that I'm having a bad day. I'm not in a depressive state. You know, a good friend of mine, Dr. John Deloney is, is brilliant when it comes to this. Everybody wants to say they have anxiety. They have anxiety. They have anxiety. You don't. Anxiety is not bad. Anxiety is your body's alarm bells going off, saying your environment, your situation, something's going wrong. So the doctors are very quick to mute that sign. And now you don't have that internal dialogue happening within your body to be able to understand what the problem is. You mask it with a drug and then you keep going down the same path that will have the same sort of effect. And then they keep bumping the dosage higher and higher. And so when I see young girls like this going through a highly medicated state, the parents of the wealthy, they want their children to be silent and away and less less of a problem. And that's just truly what I see. And it sounds like based on your examples, this isn't just something that I'm seeing. This is also something you're witnessing when you look at the wealthier children versus the poverty stricken children. It seems like, and this is a terrible thing to say, the poverty stricken children have a better chance at finding themselves outside of obviously the gang situation and the heavy other situations. Don't get me wrong in the absentee parenting due to the multiple jobs. I'm not saying it's better. I'm saying they're not as quick to medicate their children because number one, they're not there. Or number two, they don't have the money to do it. And that might be the saving grace. Yeah. And I think that, you know, those hardships, <clears throat> excuse me, do open up, you know, trying to, you know, a lot of self-discovery, you know, it's, it's, of course. it's so mixed. It's so mixed though. Cause if I just like take like the students that I taught, taught for mm -hmm. about seven years, like really tough areas, like those kids, it's, it's, it's a mix. You know, you can find patterns about what makes certain kids successful and what doesn't. But you can also see that with like the, the wealthier kids. You know, you talk about alarm bells. What I saw is that when I would ask questions, stuff like, how do you know that it's, it's a broken smoke alarm and not that there's actually smoke? Like, mm. how do you know that your brain's not releasing, you know, the happy chemicals uh, and, and not that, you know, and how do you know that it's not doing it because of a reason? Like, you don't, you know, you're not having a meaningful, fulfilling life. And, or how do you know that your brain's broken? But all these kids can't have their brains broken, especially ADHD. ADHD is even a crazier one because I see it with a lot of young boys and they, they write me essays about how they don't like it, but they also 
just can't fit into the school system. Like they have all this energy. We feed them tons of sugar. We have donut day, you know, three days a week and stuff like <sighs> that. Tons of sugar. Every school, if you go to like public schools across the country, they all have a contract with either Coke or Pepsi. Of course. So they have like, you know, they have sodas, they have the, the vending machines and stuff like that in between classes. That's all you can get. And then you get all sugared up, sit down under fluorescent lights and listen to teachers, which most teachers are boring af as the kids say and it's right. just like you're sitting there listening to them talk in front of the room and you're, and you're just like i can't handle this i can't handle this and then you start to get bad grades people say you're dumb then you're like oh my gosh so you, you you choose to let go of some of yourself and everything like that to fit into this system and and that's that's what i'm just seeing over and over and over again and the data support that john hike you know shows the mm -hmm. data on that kind of stuff it's really clear that that seems that's going on i mean it's so clear to me that it's not that all these kids have broken brains really well, that's the next thing I want to discuss with you is this ADD, ADHD diagnosis, mm -hmm. because I am, I, this again is going to be highly controversial and I, and I fully understand I'm not a medical doctor, but I do understand my body well enough to know that if I was given, I would have been given that diagnosis as a child if I yeah. wasn't in a sport, but I'm not ADD and I'm not ADHD. And I don't really believe it's a diagnosis that I truly lean into. I think when we, when we have labels and we have medications, we're always going to be pushing those on children as a solution or an answer. It's the same with post-traumatic stress disorder. It's not a disorder, it's an injury, but we call it that so that we attach to the label. When you attach the label, you are the stories you become. So with ADD and ADHD, what we've been so fortunate to understand through people like Gary Brecca, a lot of times, and 44% of Americans have a genetic makeup component called the motherfucker gene. And that will literally stop you from um, metabolizing folate. And that is in and sprayed on and everything in America, yeah, especially yeah. in America. And so when you have this problem, you develop a manic behavior, a bipolar type behavior, a schizophrenic type behavior, an ADD type behavior. Now, look, I'm not saying that it doesn't exist in some children, but I am a big proponent of doing a top-down, wide approach, pullback approach. I want to look at your parents' behavior. I want to look at what you're watching on TV. I want to look at how much screen time you have. I want to look at your sleep schedule or lack of. I want to look at your diet and your movement and your water intake before I even look to say you are X, Y, or Z. But so many teachers, so many doctors are doing the opposite of what you're doing. They're not sitting down with children. So when you say, how do we know that it's an alarm bell versus something really going on? Very simple. Well, this is not rocket science. I don't need a PhD to tell you this. Sit down, ask the questions. We don't do that, especially in Canada. We have a strict policy that if you do push past boundaries, you'll lose your medical license. So we don't encourage hard conversation about why this behavior is coming up time and time again. We don't encourage conversations with parents and understanding that their children need X amount of sleep and actual boundaries. And we don't say to people, you cannot have Coca-Cola in our school systems where there isn't even water options. There is literally only soda that has a day and a half to two days worth of uh, processed sugar inside of it, not including the caffeine that we allow young, uh, young adolescents to have, the cell phone addictions we don't address, but yet we're so quick to say you have this problem. And now look at things like TikTok and social media platforms. And I'm sure you're seeing this. Actually, I'm curious to see if you're seeing this in your school because of the programs and how Orthodox Jewish individuals raise their children radically different. Um, I'm curious to see how you're handling that. Do you see the same sort of issues with people attaching to labels and to addictions to phones and this constant dopamine problem that we're seeing in schools? That I do see. Yeah. Ah. I mean, like ADHD, you know, it's, some kids are where you, you can label whatever you want. You can just tell they're like, they're just jack Something's rabbits. off. Right. Yeah. They're just, they just, they just, you know, can't. And over the years, there's like always like one or two, but there's one or two when I'd say, you know, there's 30 that are on ADHD medication. Right. You know? So like, so that's, that's like a thing, you know, but like Huberman says, like, uh, you know, ADHD kids, when they have something that they like, they can really focus. It's like, when he said that, I'm like, no shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> Somebody you're passionate about. Can you imagine? Yeah. Um, but yes, I'm seeing what I don't see because of the community element of, mm -hmm. of like, the, the, like uh, the modern Orthodox, the, the Jewish community is there is a, such a community element and there is stuff that's built in like Shabbat and stuff like that. So they yeah. can't go on their phones. It, yeah. it gives them breaks. It's actually really awesome. I've adopted 
elements of the way that they do life in my own family. Cause I'm like, I see the benefit to this. Like just mm-hmm. for, for, for 24 hours every week, you just don't go on your phone. You know, you just have to rest like that kind of stuff is good. So I think like what, what, what I miss out on at this school now compared to before is like teen pregnancy is non-existent. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, drugs are pretty non-existent. Like, I think my, my kids like smoke weed and stuff like that, but nothing like beyond that. I mean, they do, <laughs> they do like essentially Adderall, but like that's prescribed, right. but like that kind of stuff, they don't, they're not involved in like violence and things like uh, things along those lines, you know, suicide is really low. Cause I think a lot of that comes down to the community and the fail safes that are built into that, to that ideology. But, well, but and as far as phones and stuff, sorry, but as far as phones and stuff like that go, 100%, they're addicted. They're on TikTok. They're getting, mm-hmm. um, they're getting the, the dopamine hits from social media and stuff like that. Like, like everyone else, I'm, I'm, I'm on board with the idea of the dangers of, of smartphones for them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, Rogan has that saying, like, you can take a hammer, you can build a house, you can hit yourself in the dick with it. I just don't understand why schools are so uh, reluctant to ban them during school hours mm-hmm. or literally have them. So when you walk in, they go into a sack that we have anytime you go to a comedy show. I mean, this yeah. stuff feels like common sense, but yet it doesn't feel that common because it feels like there is a lack of critical thinking, a lack of education when it comes to just literal life uh, in general and understanding that we have something greater happening here to children. We have, whether it's an over, over medicating uh, our young youth or whether it's just a lack of accountability on parents' uh, parts because it's easier to give them screens. So. I want to understand a little bit deeper how you've been handling a few things. And so just bear with me because this might be uncomfortable. You do, uh, my family is Jewish. I am not. My son is. My husband is. This has been an interesting time uh, to be alive, to be witnessing wars the way we are. I mean, I've been in one. Uh, Now we have a million proxy ones going on around the globe. And we have this really massive divisiveness that's happening you being at a Jewish school, how has that impacted you as a teacher? Do you see an impact on the students around you and the family members? Is this just something I'm seeing or are you experiencing it as well? Um, it's, it's actually great because I can, I can, uh, I can, uh, when I say attack them, what I mean is like, get to them. That's what my job right. is to, is to get the, I'm here, you know, yeah. <laughs> so I can, when I say attack, I'm not attacking my students. <laughs> um, but I can get them from like, you're in a position of, 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 power you're in a position of you know what like of of like um prominence you're you're headed toward good colleges you have you know wonderful families and you have some you know some like money and stuff like that because it's la you know it's like the west side of la and stuff like that but you're mm-hmm. also a minority like if i was teaching at just a, a wealthy uh private school that wasn't jewish and i don't have that that hook to get them of like yeah. you know what it's like to be oppressed you know what it's like to have people around the world and in your city hate you for who you right. are and it's really good for me because i can teach civil rights and stuff like that when I'm, when I'm teaching history and say like this kind of example you know i can use so many hypothetical examples about like attacks like what if someone came to your house and uh you know spray paint a swastika and stuff like that and then i can so some of my kids because they're you know a lot of them are like upper class or from wealthy families they will say things that will be like very insensitive about certain minority groups and stuff like that sometimes. And mm-hmm. I can turn it around and, and give them a hypothetical that puts them in the, in the shoes and then it gets them. So it's been really wonderful in, in that way that I can get them. As far as like the, the stuff going on with like the protests and, and things like that, I talked to former students, like alumni of mine who are at Columbia, UCLA, USC and stuff like that, just asking them about it. And, you know, it, they're mixed. I have former students that went and joined the IDF and they're over there fighting and, Mm-hmm. Again, what I do, and it's so incredible my school allows this. My school is a Zionist school. So, right. But I challenged them. They brought in some people who were um, at that music festival and okay. like lost family members and stuff like that and mm-hmm. watched like their family members die. And they came in and told the story. And my students were really affected by that. And I like felt that, felt their like, you know, pain for a little bit about that. But then I challenged them because it's what I kind of do. And I said, right. like, because my wife knows someone who um, her family uh, was living in Gaza. And she Mm -hmm. lost her mom, her dad, and her sister. I said, Mm -hmm. why is your school not bringing in that woman to talk about her experience? And it made them Mm -hmm. go like, oh, yeah, well, I guess we do kind of have an agenda here. And it's like, I'm not knocking your agenda, but you should be aware that there is an agenda here. And, and, And I get to really challenge them. And the fact that my school... I don't know if they actually knew that I did that, but like, I didn't get in trouble for saying that. And I think that that's, it, it follows that, that trajectory of the way that they are, which is like, you're getting our kids to think that's all good. I, I'd rather them um, do that. But, it, but I, it gives me like these, these ins because they do have a tribal nature built into them, us versus them, you know, 
Arabs versus, you know, Israelis and all that kind of stuff. So it, it, it makes my teaching job easier. And brought to you by Mindful Meds. You guys have been seeing me take Mindful Meds for a little while now. Mindful Meds is a premium supplement company dedicated to supplying humans with the tools to improve their mental health, clarity, and performance, all while supporting their growth along the way. Whether it's the Immunity Blend, Lion's Mane, Inspire, or Voyage, all of their products are clean, tested, consistent, and they've become a huge help in my life. I found Mindful Meds over a year ago now, and I've never looked back. Go check out their website, mindfulmeds.io, and use the code BRASS at checkout. Yeah, of- absolutely. I mean, I've, I've, I've been having a lot of these conversations re- uh, recently with uh, some of my case managers and things like that, because I was told for 10 years to get over what I saw in terms of the feelings around certain religions and around certain people and around all of these things. And then, you know, I actually, to be fully transparent, had a fucking moment yesterday. And I said to my case manager and I said, please tell me if I'm wrong here. And she goes, what's that? And I said, in Canada, we're seeing a, we we have a small invasion happening the same way you do. Uh, I'm all for taking refugees. I have no issue. I never have. I'm an immigrant family on both sides of my family. I'm a big believer that people should be able to come somewhere where they can not be attacked and murdered in their homes. I'm a big believer on that. Here's where my line is drawn. And I'm pretty open about it. If you come here, and you try to erase everything that makes my country what it is and tell me that I'm hateful, you can get the fuck out. These people are right and these people are wrong. You're a part of the problem. And I'm not okay with it in schools. I don't care if you're a Zionist school, a Catholic school, or you're a Muslim school. Anybody who preaches hate, it's unacceptable behavior on both sides. So the fact that you challenge the system the way you do is the only hope I have for people like you. Teachers, they have to challenge the narrative or we're gonna keep going down this path of divisiveness and war for the, until we blow ourselves into smithereens. Yeah, Um, I'm with you, but teachers, they don't. The fact is that they don't. It's so weird that me doing what I'm doing, it's not, it's so, I think what resonates with, with people like you is like, you're like, yeah, this is your job. You should be doing this. This is what you should be doing as a teacher. Yes. You should be getting people to think. But that's, but the reason why I have whatever, like a following or whatever you want to call it, it's so gross, like an audience on, on like social it's media and stuff gross. like that. You should be proud of it. <laughs> You're doing but something like, right. <laughs> Thank you. But like, the reason is because it is, it is unusual. It is rare. You know, I'm looking left, looking right. It's like, where are the other teachers who are talking about this stuff? And they can't. They, they, they can't. Part of, part of me being at, at, a, at an Orthodox Jewish school, um, me having a wife who's an immigrant who like, you know, hustles real hard and like makes, makes like more money than I do, like gives me like some security there. So like that helps. But, right. but teachers fall into the same simplistic narratives that, that happen. Even if they're trying to be unbiased, an example I give in, in my class is like, you could say, let's say like, let's say Cindy is like a, a thin lady, right? You could say Cindy is gaunt. You could say Cindy is thin. You could say Cindy is emaciated. Just the language you use is still going to be painting a picture for your kids in your class and stuff like that. That's, at, that's when the, for the teachers who, who are trying to cover up their biases. But most teachers mm. are very upfront about it. And this, this idea, this is what the CRT debate was all around in like 2020 and stuff like that, was it's this critical social justice stuff of oppressor versus oppressed. And it's just, it's the lens that you see everything through and that has taken over the education system. I think it was yesterday, Dr. Biden, um, she doesn't, I don't think she does surgery, but like Dr. Biden brought in uh, a whole bunch of, of teachers. It was like a teacher like thing, like appreciation. There was this gala, this very fancy dinner and stuff like that. And the teachers that got invited are the same teachers that win the national teacher of the year. <laughs> I've had them, I've had three of them on my podcast until I was told that they won't grant me another one, like the, whatever the organization is, mm-hmm. because I'm not like. Uh, an educator of color, it's all, they're all, they're all like woke for lack of a better term. They're all woke. And, and not only that, but they don't understand any kind of pushback. I ask them sincere questions. I'm, I'm actually a curious person. I'm not trying to catch anybody or anything like that. I'm just you like, do trying seem to understand that it. way though. You seem very honest and just very curious. And it's almost like a fault now. Well, it's, it's disarming for people because, but because if you ask questions, like a lot of this I just keep using woke, like ideology that's just taken over schools. It's taken over the the colleges of education. It's every national teacher of the year, you know, honored by the president is that way. Like it's just, it's just everywhere. And 
the, 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 the concept uh, applies here in the, the Jewish, going back to the, what we were talking about, about like everything in the Middle East, is Israel, because of the lifestyle that they lead, because of things like that. Barry Weiss had a great book on how to fight anti-Semitism. And it was like, anti-Semitism hits three different angles. It's you are like the, the, the hardcore alt-right people. The Jews will not replace us. It's like you're, you're you know, like not not white and you're also like like the worst you're like you're like you're like, you're like that that like racial purity nazi stuff so you're hated by the, the the far right the far left who doesn't like the 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 um indiscre the, the 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 discrepancy in in like social class and things like that the oppressor versus oppressed jews are overrepresented like two percent of the american population like 40 percent of doctors and uh tenured college professors and stuff so you're overrepresented if you're talking about equity overrepresented in these positions of power so the uh, the extreme left has to hate you too but then there's the radical islamic jihadists too so you're getting it from all angles so you so Jewish like ideology, uh, or I'm sorry, like people who are Jewish in the Jewish community are going to be a victim of this oppressor versus oppressed. It doesn't matter that you go back to history, you point to all the ways the Jews have been crushed by one person after another, that there's probably a dozen or two countries across the world that doesn't have a single Jew because they would get murdered as soon as they're walking the street. There's like a million Arabs in Israel. All that stuff doesn't matter because it's just oppressor versus oppressed. When you look at these college campuses, it's all just oppressor versus oppressed. It's just a very simplistic way to see the world also a massive believer in that if you look at your life as a victim, your life will be so. And we have a bad habit of telling Black Americans, uh, Palestinians, uh, Muslim individuals, anybody that's essentially not white, um, that your life is going to be this because white people have made it so hard for you. And if you keep teaching this victim mentality the same way I said at the beginning of the conversation, which is you are the stories you tell yourself, it's really tragic because I had a, a really wonderful man who's since passed on the show, Chris Elise, who is a, he was a photographer from France and he is a black, um, black man. And he came here as a, an unknown photographer and was the only for a very long time, black photographer for the NBA. It was mind boggling. And he was incredibly uh, talented in what he did. And then he, uh, right before he passed, he was shooting for the, uh, the professional, the PBR, I think it's called. And so just insanely talented man. And we talked about racism in America and uh, we talked about racism in France. And it was really fascinating to me to hear him say these words, these are not mine, but he said, racism uh, doesn't exist in America the way they think it does. And I kind of like, I was like, uh, Chris, I don't think you can say that right now, man. And he goes, no, I'm going to, and I'll tell you why. And you can go back and listen to that episode. He was very, very uh, intense about it. He goes, you america has had a black president like an african-american president you have a a lackluster at best uh, terrible example of a vp who's also of color and then you go to places like france and the areas where i grew up where if your name was muhammad or you were black you weren't even able to get a home or a car like in this day and age but yet People in America scream how oppressed they are. And it's like it's this uh, the snake eating the tail. It's you're not they're not able to unswallow themselves and look up and see how much uh, there is opportunity because they're constantly people are constantly told you're never going to get to where you want to be because of the color of your skin. When really all it ever comes down to is your mindset. And, and, and people say, well, Kelsey, you're white. You can't say that. Well, first off, I'm not fully white. We, I'm Hungarian at best. Let's start that. Um, secondly, I'm also Irish and Scottish. And like, I don't like when people say you're white, you can't have these conversations. And I say, well, this is part of the problem is I'm not saying it from a hateful place. I'm saying it because I'm genuinely not understanding why we're okay with telling our young youth that they can never be anything. And I'll give you a quick example of one story that I love so much. A friend of mine, Trung, he is from Vietnam. He came here on a boat, like single mom, hard life, grew up in the ghetto of Chicago, you know, grew up in um, government housing, sketchy area, always around gangbangers kind of thing. He was on the show telling me the story. And this is why I don't agree that there is this massive problem. We create the problems, right? He goes, you know, Kelsey, I had a, I had a police officer from a gang union that stopped me one day when I was 14 and give me his card and say, use this if you ever need it, but you've got to stop hanging around these people if you want to do anything in your life. And it wasn't because he was told, Trong, you're never going to be anything. You're never going to achieve anything. You came from a place. This is the color of your skin. You're always going to be here. Instead, he was given one moment of, of hope where he goes, it doesn't matter what you look like, where you come from. 
you can achieve whatever it is you want to. And I'm here to help you do that. And he was fortunate enough. And he goes, at that moment, I decided I was going to become a SWAT for Chicago. Sure enough, he went off to be a special operator, like a high functioning special operator for America, served Americans. And then he went and went back to becoming one of the top SWAT officers in Chicago in the same area. And then he left and now he's teaching all of these police officers and he's got these incredible companies called We Go Home. And my whole point to that story is if we could get ourselves out of the victim mentality that we continuously teach in our schools that you are oppressed and that it is a problem and we can genuinely say, it doesn't really matter what your skin color is. It has absolutely nothing to do with it in this day and age. But for some reason, North Americans seem to create problems. We create chaos. We create division. And it's because we have nothing better to do. Yeah, they, I've, I've found that kids live up or down to your expectations. And I always kept high expectations for kids. Um, and then, you know, I, I taught like in those tougher neighborhoods. I reach out to them now. You know, they're almost 30 years yeah. old. I've been doing this for a long time. And, uh, and they, they uh, see what I was doing. because I was holding a hard line with them. And a lot of teachers it's that mentality of if they, they could like punch their, 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 their friend in the face, they could steal stuff. And it's like, well, his mom hasn't been around and his dad's not there. And he's like, I, I know, I know. Like the, the problem about the victim victimizer relate, like a uh, way of seeing the world is you are a victim. Like I tell my students that like you, if you want to see yourself as a victim, you can Kelsey, you can look at all the things you've been through. You could just be a victim. I had Sidney Smith, in my podcast. He's so dope. He lost both of his legs when he was like in his mid twenties, became an Ironman triathlete. Right. And like, I asked him, like, like, why didn't you just take the out? He's like, I knew it was a trap. I knew he just has zero victim mentality in him. And like that, that kind of term has been co-opted by whatever, like Candace Owens and stuff. But like, what, like, it, it's very present in the education system. I mean, and we see this with, like, there's something called the achievement gap. For those that don't know, essentially, black and brown kids score lower on standardized tests and reading comprehension and stuff like that um, than like white and Asian kids. And the, the solution is to look into why and then fix the problem from the why. Because the why is two things. It's one, it's it's that they're just not capable. Black, brown and black kids just can't do this stuff, which is not like true. a foundational idea of racism that is clearly not true, okay? <laughs> and then the other one is the, is the idea that there's something off. It could be within family, it could be within culture, it could mm -hmm. be within education, whatever it is. But once you point out, once you recognize it's the second one, then you go out and you say like, well, they can't jump over these hurdles. It's like, get them stronger legs. You don't lower yes. the hurdle. Yes. How is that going to serve them in any kind of way throughout their life? Now you're just going to lower the bars and stuff like that. The the affirmative action stuff, getting kids into college. You look at the dropout rates oh. of kids that are brought in. It's, is that better? So now you're a failure. You go off to college. Everyone's celebrating. Oh, they got into Stanford or something. Then you can't hang. So they drop you. Or what they do is they change, they limit the, the majors you can choose. You can't choose engineering or mathematics. You can choose, you know, whatever, sociology or something. Is that like the definition of racism? It's crazy. It's like, it's a soft bigotry of low expectations. You know, that gets thrown mm. around a lot. I think I find that. But that is the way, I don't know if you ever saw, about two years ago, I did a, an Instagram live with three critical race theory educators. And I kept them oh, on the line. Like, I kept talking to them. It's, it's, if I could have, have been involved in one thing, it has nothing to do with me, but like, if I could be, if I could share one thing I've ever been involved with, with like the world, they're like, you have like to, to share something on the Super Bowl, it would be that. Cause it's so rare that you get educators who are deep devout, you know, like John McCorder says, like, this is like a religion um, with this ideology to just talk for two hours. And all mm. I did was just ask questions and it was wild. And then these people, one of them's on the school board in Atlanta. Um, uh, the other one is brought, paid tremendous amounts of money to go speak to schools and stuff like that because they have their PhD in yeah. critical social justice and things like that. It's very wild when you actually see what's going on under the surface. But teachers, so as my rant, like teachers are soft hearted. We're soft hearted individuals. Mm -hmm. So if you say this is a marginalized group, these are trans kids, these yeah. are, you know, black kids, these are whatever kids it is, we're just, we're just built, who gets into teaching? They're not like hard asses, they're like soft people that want to give hugs and stuff. So you say this is a marginalized group, you go, okay, well, I'm going to love on you, I'm going to try and make you feel good. Chris Williamson talked about this idea of toxic compassion. It's mm -hmm. everywhere. You're, you're serving the now kid and not the kid in two months and 20 years down the road. You're mm -hmm. screwing that person over for the, yeah. the, 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 like the junk food, um, of good feeling now. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just so clear that that's what's happening across schools. And I, I just, I just, I can't do it. You say like, you're not allowed to say that you're not allowed to ask questions. 
no, I'm asking questions. I might not make declarative statements. I'm not going to say the N word or something like that, but I'm going to ask questions forever because right. the day you say I can't ask questions, the day you crush curiosity is the day that we're in some deep trouble as far as education goes. And I think that's, that's also the problem is just asking questions makes you problematic. Then, then we're, we're, we're really lost. Well, then you're Canadian. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, true. Then you guys, hey, well, yeah. you, you started this by saying like one person can't make a change. Talk about Trudeau. Look at that. That one guy. <laughs> he made Ooh. some, he had an impact. <laughs> yeah. Talk about the collapse of society around one human being. He's going to be remembered as somebody with Hitler and Stalin. <laughs> like that's really where this man has sold us out to the CCP and the CSIS documents can prove it. We have literally seen a downfall of a society in a time frame where I am Thousands. old enough to to, oh, he is talented. I mean, he's a drama teacher. Give him time. He's got more to show him and his divorced wife. And the, the best part is his wife, ex-wife coming out and say, I love how they say estranged. They won't even say ex. It's comical. Um, his estranged wife was saying, I wish these politicians would grow up and be men. And you know who she's talking about. I feel... I feel truly saddened for his children that they have to carry on knowing that that was your father. It's like, it's no different than these uh, other dictators of the world. And I'm not going too far in saying that at all. Hence the new hate bill coming in, which means it's about time for me to move real quick. So the, the I just talked to my friend from, from uh, he's in, he's in Montreal area. And he said the yeah. same thing. He's like, I'm moving. He's like, I got to go to the Cayman Islands or something like that. He's like, cause he has a social media platform where he asks questions like I do. He's like, I'm going to get arrested. Well, and so that was actually what was really fascinating. Uh, you brought it up. Like I, I talked to Jordan two weeks ago and uh, off air, you know, my husband and my husband came with me. He doesn't often get the opportunity to come to shows just because he he holds the fort down for our tiny human. And, you know, we got to we got to ping pong it off. Right. And so he came with me and he he looked at me. He goes, look, I want to ask you a hard like serious conversation um, and I'm question and I'm sorry to you know bother you. And he goes, no, no, no. hit me with it. He goes, um, what do we do? because we're seeing this with her platform. We're seeing this by the CRTC. We're seeing this with Bill C-11 and the new hate bill coming into place. And Jordan, I will never forget it because that is a man that looks through your soul, looked at me and said, you're gonna have to move soon if you don't wanna go to prison. That was terrifying to me because the idea that my show will be seen as hateful is just the most, to me, is just shown the decline. Um, you have really hard conversations on your platform. I have incredibly different, different but hard conversations on my platform. And we both, uh, we interject and we, we go over top of each other and overlap on a lot of different topics. And the idea that somebody could be put in prison for life, by the way, life. This isn't, uh, you know, you get a slap on the wrist. This is life in prison. This is communist dictator level things. We've seen this with, with like I said, with the, the bills that continuously keep coming through as well as things like made and just the idea that we're going to eradicate the problem uh, humans from the earth because it's easier to handle. I, I do wonder, are you concerned ever about uh, your own safety, uh, your your wife's job, your job? Are you concerned about your children? Are you the type of person who's going to have to get up and leave LA and start moving to places like Arizona or Tennessee or Florida or Texas like me? Yeah, um, we've thought about it. <laughs> yeah. no, my kids have it. My kids are young. They're nine, seven, and two. Uh, they're in like competitive jujitsu. They have a great gym here. You know, we have friends here, family here. Uh, my mom just moved out here. So it's like, we're kind of rooted here. Um, yeah. as far as like, like fear of the, of like, of what's happening. I don't, I find that a lot of the people who are in America anyway, you know, we have the constitution, we're a little bit more protected right. than you are. So, but the people who are like woke, who the people who come after me on like social media and stuff like that, like I, I find them to be cowards, to be honest. Like they're, they're not, Correct. they're like my, the way that I interact with people online, I, I really want to stand by forever. There's nothing that I put on my social media, any comment. I comment on things all the time, just to kind of stir the, stir the pot. I just want to yeah, spark thought. It. Like Socrates says, you know, he's like, I can't teach anybody anything. I can just spark thought. So that I try to do that a lot just to open people's minds up. I just want to get a little crack. Once you get a little crack, then, you know, it's like just a little bit, like Plato's allegory of the cave. Like once you see a little pinhole, like maybe I'm in a cave, like, all right, just a little crack. It sparked that curiosity. Um, I find them to be cowards, to be honest. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I've gotten like direct threats from people and things like that. I don't, I mean, I, no, I'm not, I'm not super worried about it. I'm not worried about the government coming after me. I mean, I think my approach 
is disarming for these people because there are people that are really harsh and they know that, you know, whatever it is, you know, it could be MAGA or whatever it is. It's like, you know, F the woke people and you're all crazy and all trans mm-hmm. people are bad. I've had nine different trans people on the podcast. Some of them like Buck Angel and Xander Keg. I and just Matt Beggs. had Buck on. He's dope. I love him. Love yeah. that guy. Yeah, it's so reasonable, right? So it, what that does, it adds like nuance to my understanding. And then I can push back on the on the right wingers too, who are just like, you know, you should go to the bathroom of your biological sex. It's like if you have a daughter and Buck Angel walks into the women's room, you'd be like, dude, what are you doing here? Like it's it's right. complex, you know. Yes. Like like let's work this stuff out. So so I, I think my approach is one that that keeps me somewhat out of like people get frustrated with me, but I it's hard to to like pin me as I think it's hard to pin me as like, you know, like ill-intentioned or like bad. Some people think that, that, that I am, and I'm just, this is all, this is all the guys that I've been keeping up for years. Um, <laughs> but, but I think that because of that, I'm not super worried about it. I'm not taking hard mm-hmm. stances. I just lean in the curiosity. When someone says you're terrible, you should be not around kids. What I do is I send them a direct message. Sometimes if I have time, send them a direct <laughs> message of me with like my, my, holding my baby or something like, Hey, I'm Will, I'm a real person. Um, I'm sorry if I offended you or or upset you or something like that. Maybe we could have a public conversation and work this out and model some civil discourse or something like that. And I do that, you know, 99 times out of a hundred, they don't take me up on it. Every once in a while they do, but mostly they don't. I think because of that, I'm not, I'm not super scared, but we don't have a bill like what is it? C 11? Is that what it is? Oh, Bill C 11. Yeah. 63 is the new hate bill. 63. Um, Yeah. And so if I misgender someone or I say something that upsets someone in some way, which is. Or you might do it. I heard too. Oh yeah, like, that myth, that preemptive, right? The that preemptive you just seem thing, like, like minority yeah. report. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, just so like Kelsey, we know you're thinking it. We know you're well, thinking look at it. Me. Like I look like someone who's about to, <laughs> who's about to like you know kick a trans person. Like, I just, I'm like I, waiting I check all the for boxes. the video. Yeah, I'm waiting for the video to come out to be like, oh, I knew that guy. I knew he was about <laughs> that. Know. That's you, but it's no different than me, right? It's like the idea uh, of uh, you and I having that conversation of race. That that's gonna be. Just people can't, they can't stomach the idea that we can't have nuanced conversations because we're both white. We can't have a say in those conversations. We can't have a say in watching, you know, because I think where I always come from it, and I, I kind of broke down about this and I said this as well is I'm not a hateful person. I am just for no. common sense and I am for the stories we tell ourselves. I am my coach for a living. My job is to work with people and come in and say, like I had a teacher. Perfect example. I had a teacher yesterday. It's a teacher I've known for some time. And she said to me, Kelsey, I, I can't do this job anymore. I cannot. I'm educated. I can't do it anymore. I'm a single mom. I can't afford. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, can't do this. Can't do that. Can't do that. And I looked at her because I've been stern with her before. This is that, that toxic uh, compassion, right? I looked at her. I took my glasses off and I said, sit down. And I got very stern with her. I said, with that attitude and that mindset, you're going to stay right where you are for the rest of your life. Is that what you want? She goes, no. I said, then go grab your dictionary and start cutting out the word can't because that's what my mother did to me, right? So that word doesn't exist. It's silly. And so I said, if you want to change your life, you need to start acting like you want to change your life because you say you want all of these things, but yet you're not, behavior is not following through on any of them. So. It's in the work you're not doing. You have the answers. Hang up the fucking phone and start implementing the tools. But until you do that, I'm not going to sit here and give you the same information I've given you time and time again. When you've hit rock bottom and you're over it, you'll change it. But nobody can make you do anything until you're ready to do it yourself. It's the same way. She was told, yes, but and people affirm her, right? She's a single mom. That's why this is happening. That's why. No, stop it. Stop telling people they cannot achieve what they want to achieve because they're a single mom, because they're a person of color, because they come from another country, because their language is yada, yada, yada. The family I saved from Afghanistan was high ranking in the Afghan government. Okay. Mm. VIPs, mostly women. One of them right now is doing her PhD in Ottawa and was a guest lecturer in Ottawa University. The other one is now studying, surpassed high school, didn't even need to do it because she was so smart, is off to university herself. The other one has just had an American baby, American-born little girl, and she is off to school and off working. Stop saying you can't do the things you can do. You're just not trying hard enough. I get it. You go to the South, you go to the Bible Belt, we might be having a different conversation in some rural areas. I get it. I come from a family of truck drivers. I've been to every spot in America. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but you can choose to see it or you can choose to live a life that is 
devoid of it and say, no, nope, not for me. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. I'm yeah. going to do this, this, and this. Not, not uh, in spite of, but because of. Yeah, and I think uh, some people who talk about being like from a family of immigrants, I learned this because I married my wife who came to this country when she was eight years old. There were 10 of them in a one bedroom apartment. So like, they were just, it, was, it was like wild from the Philippines. Yeah. And I love uh, that. She, my wife has never taken that approach of like, I'm a victim. I can't do this stuff. This, this whole thing, like never. And, and so I'm from like waspy East coast, you know, <laughs> family that was like, where can I find a problem that I can try to exploit and get some sympathy, you know, right. but what will serve you best is really what it is. Right. It's like when you're in survival mode, which my, my, my wife has mm -hmm. like down to her core, it's like, what's going to serve you best. And I tell my students that too, is like, you want, like I said, like you can find, see how you're a victim or how you were dealt a bad hand. You were dealt a seven, two offsuit. But how are you going to play it? You got to play right. your hand best you can. I mean, what, mm -hmm. what's, what, what's going to serve you? Do it from a selfish right. point of view. Is looking at yourself how you're a victim and trying to get pity points and stuff like that, even though there are elements of that in society, that will only get you so far. It won't get you very far at all. Even in a super like woke society, it's not going to get you very far. You got to do what's best for you and look at all the, the, the benefits that you have from this. You know, if you, I tell my students, this sounds really cliche, but it's like, Think about bad things happening for you and not to you. It's just, it's a, it, it's great. It's, say. it's silly. It's great. It's great because it's like, even if you're people are like, well, you're just deluding yourself. It's like, sure, sure. Like I'm doing what I need to do to be successful and get to where I want to be in life. So if you're saying like, I'm just deluding myself and I'm, I'm being ignorant to my reality and stuff like that. Yeah. But shouldn't you play a seven, two offsuit? Like you, like if you're going to bluff, you got to bluff, you got to believe it. I just, right. I just, I think about that stuff and that's the opposite message that a lot of kids are getting. Unfortunately, it's not about that. It's not about, you know, yeah, whatever, whatever life throws at you, you can handle it. Go out there, go get it. All that Jocko stuff. I love all that stuff. And, and teachers don't even know who Jocko is, you know, that's not a surprise to me. Um, it's it, it, because, well, because also, you know, a lot of people don't want to bring in, you know, that, that, that mentality of this life is happening for you, not to you, because they need to have the excuse as to why they failed in their life. And that's why their life is what it is. Yeah. And, you know, people are so quick, uh, so, so quick to quit and to stop trying and to just lean on whatever, you know, uh, issue they have and exploit it to the fullest extent. But people don't want to bring in books like mine or like Jocko's or like other individuals like Goggins. They don't want to bring in books of resilience and strength and overcoming because then everything that they're teaching, it, it kind of contradicts it. Right. It kind of is this mentality of like, well, if you look at people like Goggins, it's like, well, he joined the military, you know, people only join the military if they're not smart. It's, well, that's not true. I've seen oh. more people be successful in Congress, in business, in anything else that were prior service members because they understand work ethic. They understand how to run businesses. They understand leadership uh, components where that's just not taught in our school systems. And so the schools are letting and, and let me say this, at least where we live. The schools are letting children down. And the reason the teachers in the schools are letting children down is because our government would rather take money from programs and send them to countries that we don't need to be in to fight wars we have no part in and to, and to do things that, frankly, Canadians, can, I mean, born and raised or came in here legally Canadians don't even get access to. Right now, if you come into this country, it's the same with America. They'll give you a credit card. You'll get a stipend of around three thousand, three to four thousand dollars a month. You'll get a certain level of housing. Where, as the homeless veterans, they get none of that. They get no access. They get absolutely nothing. And the thing that bothers me about it is because we are sending a signal to the rest of the world that North America would rather burn in order to fight your wars and to support those citizens and allow them to come in and take American flags down and burn them and take Canadian flags down and burn them. And we're not gonna do anything about it. And we're gonna give you our money instead. We have lost the plot and our teachers are the ones that are at the lowest common denominator. And they sit there and say, well, we don't have the funding. It took me two years ago, threatening police and media, which I end up doing, in order to get extra help in my son's class for a child that had become so violent, he was cutting other children's throats with keys in kindergarten. There's just no funding. And I'm not saying it's the teacher's fault. I'm saying 
I get it. I wouldn't want to do a job that's below the poverty line either, especially in somewhere like British Columbia, where housing for a two bedroom, one, you know, a one bedroom apartment uh, or basement suite is around three grand a month. That's just, that doesn't make sense. We've lost the plot. So I want to understand something else with you because this is something I've heard you talk about with Buck and I've heard you have these conversations. We have the thing up here called Soji123. Do you know what Soji is? No, I don't. So it's this program that is taught in Alberta and British Columbia and Ontario schools. Notice how the rest of the provinces aren't. And it's Soji, sexual orientation and gender identification from kindergarten and up. This is pro-trans books, pro-binary books, you name it, we're teaching it, the they, them, the rainbows, the all of it. Now, after speaking with my school, not every teacher has to teach it, but a lot do choose to teach it, which is where my problem is. It just feels like mass manipulation and it's very easy to convince children of things. So how do you handle that as a teacher now in 2024? Yeah, I've had several um, trans students, even at this Jewish school. Um, I've had uh, a bunch of students come out to me as their first person to be for being gay wow. um, over the years. Uh, I ask questions. So mm -hmm. if, if, you know, when they have these questions about stuff, if they're saying like, you know, I think that I'm, I'm a, I'm, you know, pansexual or I'm a non-binary or something like that. What does that mean? Well, right. what's, what's the difference between that and just feeling that you don't fit into the world? Maybe you're a highly sensitive person or maybe you're this, but you know, like, like, and I ask these questions and they've never gotten these questions. Right. And it's like, this, that's what's crazy about this is because of the concept and the way we've labeled gender affirming care. I think it was Jordan Peterson talking about this. Like yeah. the job of a therapist is never to affirm, <laughs> affirm what you want, what you want me to say. That sounds, mm -hmm. that's, we know that's crazy. It's the same way the C-16 bill got passed. We, we take our common sense that we know is what is right and wrong, what is, what is black and white, all that kind of stuff. And then when you add a very marginalized group, and you insert them into it, and then it's the kindness shown to that group. We abandon all of the principles that we know to be true because we are we want to either appear to be, or we genuinely are concerned about the well-being of marginal marginalized people. So I ask a lot of questions, a lot, and sometimes they get frustrated because they don't, they haven't thought about this stuff, and they storm off or something like that. But like my approach is one that that is is very disarming. Um, but I've, I've had a lot of these students and, you know, when it comes to like gay students and stuff like that, it, I, I saw that as very different, um, than, than trans. I think some kids are like clearly gay, you know, and like, mm -hmm. and so, um, there's been really beautiful stories of like, in like the Jewish community of like a kid's mom knew before he did. Um, and so she went out and tried to like, you know, make it more accepting and stuff like that of yeah. homosexuals in like the community, like really beautiful stories of love and, and things along those lines too. It, it is. It, it is ha when it's handled properly, I think it's done very well. But I, you know, in speaking with someone like Buck or Jordan, you know, in Canada, it is the le you have to legally affirm or you lose your medical license. You can't poke and prod and ask these very critically. I think asking these questions, it prods someone to understand themselves. You know, I have this, I have this questionnaire that people can get and it's uh, the 50 self discovery questions. Most people, having the thought deeper than a cookie sheet on their life, their beliefs, yeah, their thoughts, their values, not self-aware at all. So it does feel, you know, I'm speaking to Buck about this, that it is very much like a social contagion, this need to fit in. And if you're not a part of it, then you are not a part of the group or the discussion around changes in the body and the uncomfortable, uncomfortableness that we feel as we develop. And that is something that's left out of the conversation. So for you, that is, uh, that is, encouraging to hear that you are prodding and kind of just placing the conversation on the table and going, do you know what this means? What does this look like for your life? And how do you see your life moving forward? I don't think these are, uh, I think these are questions that should be asked on a regular ongoing basis. Unfortunately, I just, I don't see it. And then the next question to Jordan was, how much longer do you think this is going to go on like this? And he seemed to have a really good answer. He says, you know, I see in the next three to four years, I'm going to see, I, he sees this burning out. Yeah. The, the fat people, are, will people go. are waking up to the, to the craziness. So when I started like my social media and stuff in like 2018, speaking out against what now we all deem as wokeness, like back in 2018, woke was like something mm -hmm. worth a badge of honor. Um, I, I was really alone. But now, mm. like more and more people are talking, even a few people within education talking about it a little bit more. People are just feeling a little bit bolder. You know, it's feel like the first chicken to poke, poke its head up and you get cut off or whatever. Yeah. Um, but first one through the door. About, yes. Talking about self awareness is um, I give in my civics class. Um, which I'm going to be teaching online next year. I do a ton of stuff with, I, I give them 
uh, political ideology quizzes. So they get three political ideology quizzes. Where are they left and what left, right, authoritarian, libertarian spectrum. But then I also give them the Enneagram, the big five mm-hmm. personality tests, like the ocean test, the one that Jordan Peterson talks about, um, uh, the Myers Briggs. I have them um, learn about the Ash experiment, about conformity, the Zimbardo, the Stanford prison experiment, the Milgram experiment. It's constant reflection, taking these tests so that they know who they are going out in the world. I think that that's a big problem with everything going on is they're not, they're not willing to look in the mirror metaphorically. They're like they're, they're just, they're, they don't know them. So going back to like philosophy, know thyself. They don't. So let's start these practices now of constantly challenging yourself. I always, I'm like a big advocate for seeking disconfirmation, not confirmation bias. Try to prove yourself wrong. So if you have an mm-hmm. idea, I'm, you know, pro-choice, pro-life, uh, you know, immigration good, immigration bad, whatever it is, guns good, guns bad. Try to prove yourself wrong. Flat Earth, try to prove yourself wrong and with like real intent. Like I'm going to really try to prove myself wrong. Can you? Because if you can pretty easily, then maybe you're wrong. And if you can't, then maybe you're onto something. And these are like the right. principles that I try and just do over and over and over again to get my kids to like just know who they are and why they react the way that they do out in the world and stuff like that. I find that I think that's really valuable. And it's something that I see lacking in adults, in adults oh. that, that I'm like, oh, that that guy's not self-aware. He doesn't understand who he is, what his place in the world is, the way the world sees him. OK, so I'm trying to, you know, it's like that that Douglas, um, a Frederick Douglass quote, you know, it's easier to. But it's like easier to, to build strong children than heal broken men or something along those mm-hmm. lines. So I tried to get them. I started as, as um, criminal justice, as I said, and I'm getting to them before, before not right. when they're broken men. Well, and that's what we're seeing, right? Candace and I had this clip kind of go viral and it was talking about male suicide. And I, you know, the majority of the listeners on the show are men just straight mm. across the board, 83% actually, and 72% yeah. American. So uh, the reason that's important is because the whole concept of everything I've ever done has been suicide prevention. And that starts with doing different types of work and prodding in different types of areas so that you can show that that never has to get to that point where that's the the option. And right now we have the highest level of male suicide we've ever seen. And as a woman that apparently is disgusting to other women that I find that troubling and concerning that our men are feeling so unloved, unseen, unwanted, unvalued that they would rather take their lives than spend the rest of their existence with their children and wives. And I find that really disconcerting. I think that we have given no help or no support to men. Sorry. Yes, honey. Um, sorry, Jackson. Jackson will be here soon, sweetie. I'm almost done. At uh, one thirty. Daddy will be home here soon. Thanks, baby. Sorry. I know the um, life. Don't worry about it. Oh yeah, I know he's gonna be eight. He's an animal. Um. So I, I find that really concerning. That for whatever reason we are allowing men to think that they don't need to exist, that the world is better. And we have these radical feminists that push this uh, agenda and ideology on the rest of the world. And I have a big, I just, I have a big problem with it. And so when I see you saying, I'm going to get to them before that becomes a problem, I'm going to get them to understand themselves, what they need, their values, their boundaries, how to ask for it, how to insert themselves and say, I need help. It's okay to cry. How do I do that? Who am I if I cry to somebody else? How am I seen? Because that is always the verbiage looking through the comments, I think what I find most disturbing is how many men say they're on their last legs. But then secondly, how many men say you to other men, you are weak. If you cry, you're pathetic, just go kill yourself. It is the most disturbing comment section I've ever been in. Well, do you know what, who my kids tend to, I heard about Andrew Tate years and years and Uh, years ago. That's where it started was TikTok and like high Mm -hmm. school boys. And they're asking me about him like, oh, he's a, he's a, you know, kickboxing champion. I follow martial arts. Pitcher. I was like, I don't know who this guy is. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, he, he fought, you know, some, some things like that. But like I got in, I started like looking at him. This is, I mean, this is several years ago. I was like, no guys, no. Like him, like Re- Wes Watson or like whatever, wherever these people are, these like dudes who are just like, man up, go out, get the Bentley, get the Bugatti, hustle, yeah, I don't like it. you know, like. You know, your girl, your girl's gross. Look at my hot chick. Look at my watch. Like all this stuff. It's so bad. And there's options. Jordan Peterson, Jocko, Joe Rogan. Like there's, there's options for like better men out there who are better in every way. Like better in, like, in, in every way. You know what I mean? Jocko's like tougher and a better husband and like more loyal in this. Like that's like, you know, and accomplish more. Like, like there's just, you have, when you, when you're not actually interacting with someone, I think about this with like, like a lot of people, um, or like gurus or whatever, like you kind of have your pick. You can pick right. anybody to listen to. Why do you choose these fools and give them your money and stuff like that when you have access to the the best, the most brilliant, the most incredible people? 
Like why, why I'll just, so I tell my young people, like I introduce them to like these examples and different kind of people for them to, to look at. So they're not just caught up. I'm like, guys, this is, this is a hustle. It's a mm -hmm. hustle and you're getting played by these guys because these kids are lost and they're, they, they don't, they're just, they, they want to, they want girls to like them and they see this dude with a whole bunch of chicks. So they're like, all right, I guess that's the way, what to do. And then they get harsher and harder and they're not actually confronting the reality of how they're feeling or anything like that. You know, so I, I, yeah, what, what's going on? The, the, the male role models. And that's something that I try to do. I mean, it makes a difference. Like I, I see these kids every day. Mm -hmm. The fact that I'm like, in shape, the fact that I like, uh, you know, train martial arts, you know, do jujitsu all the time. The fact that I have like a marriage where I talk about my wife in a positive light all the time, even yes. when we're fighting, I'm like, ah, oh, she's driving me nuts today, but she's my favorite person on the planet. You know, like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a dedicated father and all this kind of stuff. Like I, part of the reason I do that is because I have a, a level of accountability that I got to model this for my students to believe that it's possible and things like that. Like to have like a strong male role model, especially for the kids who don't have a dad present or whatever it might be. So I, tr I really, it puts extra pressure and good pressure on me to like conduct myself in a certain way. I don't want to just get super drunk and fall over or get arrested or be like passed out, you know, in, in a weird situation, mm -hmm. have one of my kids walk by like, Oh, Mr. Roosh, what's going on? So I just, I hold myself to that standard. Cause I, I think it's really important for young boys to have positive, positive male role models, obviously it sounds cliche, but like positive male role models in their life that can guide yes. them. My kids ask me questions all the time, dating questions, questions about, you know, what, you know, what their, their future careers, dating, you know, questions about how do they get stronger? How do they lose weight? I got a ton of boys and girls doing ice baths. Uh, I've done like fasting with some of them and stuff like that, which is a little tricky because you don't want to tell like teenage girls to stop right. eating. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, it's a bit uh, of a vibe. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's really it's really cool that the dynamic that I form with my students, like because I like they they don't we're not friends. They know we're not friends, you right. know, and it's never even remotely inappropriate, especially with female students. Like remotely, like I'm never alone in a room with them at all. I don't put off any of those creepy vibes. I don't think. Right. Okay. So I'm, I'm <laughs> conscious about it. But as far as like. I'm there to like guide you through this because I was a physically weak kid and I, you know, worked and worked and worked. I mean, I'm, you know, all this, the, the same people, Goggins and all that people. And I got them reading the books and I got them, you know, just like inch by inch by inch. And when they fall off, I'm like, it's okay, guys, come on, just get back on. We got this, we got this and I'll do things with them. And that's been really, really um, positive the past, like, you know, four or five years that I've been uh, going into that, whatever I get, like self-development, I guess, yeah. kind of area of, of education. Well, and I, and I love to hear that more than you can absolutely imagine because there is nothing like seeing our society turn into weak, weak, weak humans. There's yeah. nothing more disturbing than seeing massively over, overweight children growing up to thinking that they're never going to heal, never going to get better, and that they are a victim of their circumstance. Um, I know we're running out of time, so I do want to talk about something important. I, I'm very yeah. excited for this. I would like access for myself, and I know it's not for my age group, but... I would like access to it. I want to talk about, is it Patter Docs? Did I say that correct? Yeah, you did. Okay. That's, that's the name I gave it, yeah. Um, so let's talk about it. Thank you. Um, I just did like a soft launch, opened it up, you know, like starting a business. You started businesses. Like it's, I, I'm just, I'm used to being a W2 <laughs> employee. I show up, I talk about social science and I go home and, but, yep. um, you know, be the change you wish to see in the world. I think that I, for a long time, it's like, how do I scale what I do? Mm. The, the, what it came down to is like, you're the best teacher in your school. You get paid the same as the worst teacher in your school. Mm -hmm. That's a weird, that's a weird structure. What does a great teacher do to make, make a, like an actual, like great income? Like you have to get out of teaching. Well, that's the thing that I'm good at. So right. I think part of, part of why I did social media and stuff was to like, try and see, can I scale? Can I like get spark thought in people? Even if it's adults, like spark thought in people through my phone, through just like this, can I, can I do that? So I've been trying that for six, six years or something like that, five years, and it's been somewhat successful. So then it gave me enough confidence. I've had enough students now, 18 years of teaching that kids just like, oh my gosh, I learned so much and all, I've, I, you know, changed the way this, blah, 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 really meaningful things. I don't mean to dismiss it, but I just, I came to a point where I was like, what am I going to do about it? You know, mm -hmm. like the education system is so broken. What am I going to do? You know, um, Matt Boudreau, uh, you know, I talked to him with his Apogee school. I think Candace is starting an Apogee school. Mm -hmm. yes. And I was like, okay, so am I going to do a brick and mortar? I was like, if I create a brick and mortar, then I have to do all the permitting and stuff like that. And I'm going to have to run a school. I'm not going to be teaching. I want to talk to the kids. I, right. I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not. And how do I just take my classroom of, of instead of 25 to get it to 2,500 and can mm -hmm. I, and how much am I going to lose by scale? Like I can't, you know, have lunch with every kid every day, you know, every day, but like I can, I can do some of this stuff. 
So essentially I started pattern docs. The, re the name is the idea that docs is like belief that there's, it's the belief that there's patterns in kind of everything. And if you study one war, you can start to make <laughs> sense of other wars. I mean, how many times we look at like the stock market in the 1920s, then we look at like the housing market bubble in like the early 2000s. It's like, you're not seeing this pattern, you know, like yeah. over and over and over again, like, you know, weapons of mass destruction or getting arguments to get in these proxy wars. It's like the pattern over and over and over again throughout history, throughout people. And so the, the, one of the themes, the theme, the, the, it's an online educational resource. So I'm really excited. Yeah. It's an online educational resource where I'm going to have classes that are live and then they're going to be saved, but I'm also going to have pre-recorded classes. A lot of homeschool parents, they want just like, they want it very a la carte. So they mm -hmm. want their kid to have a half hour of social science a week or, you know, three hours a week. There's stuff kind of there for everybody. It's going to be civics. It's going to be U.S. history. And it's going to be a sociology class that's linked to the television show, The Simpsons. So you learn about why <laughs> people do what they do. And then you watch Simpsons episode and apply it to The Simpsons episode. And that's actually available now. Um, but oh. I, I, there's, it's really important for me to have like personal relationships with as many students as I can. To, it's application. It's mm. the question should always be, Teacher, yeah, why am I learning this? How is it going to benefit me today as a 16-year-old in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and as a 30-year-old? How is learning this information going to help me? And teachers get asked that question. They don't get, have a great answer. And everything I'm doing is about application, how this will benefit you and help you in some way. So I was like, I got to try and make a move. It's, it's a little scary. I told, I told you, it's got, it feels a little bit like Exodus getting out of something comfortable, healthcare, all that kind of stuff, to go into the unknown. But I do feel like I'm, I'm, I'm able to, to serve and I don't see other, other options like this. I mean, everyone has different products that they're trying to sell and stuff like that, or mm -hmm. promo codes. I don't, I haven't asked for a dime from anything, but this is going to be, this is going to be my, my career. Now I told my school, I'm going at least a sabbatical. They say I can come back anytime, but like, no, nope, I'm yeah. kind of burning the boats. Let me go all in on this so I can see um, how many, how many families I can serve. Well, this, really is why you will, this is why you will be successful. And this is why I am very excited for you too. It's, it's something that's incredibly necessary, very well, very much needed. It's scalable. Uh, you can bring other teachers, other people, other motivators. You can bring in so many new uh, individuals that will give a whole new level of exposure to these children. Otherwise they wouldn't have been, whether it's through funding because of the school says no or whatever the reason, but this is going to give you an opportunity to do something on a different level. And honestly, same thing I'd say to any of my clients, man. <laughs> if you want to do anything great in this world, you're going to have to take the risk and you got to be in with both feet. Otherwise you're, you might as well not even start. And that's exactly where the growth lies. Right. Yeah. I think, and I, and, and again, it's modeling it for my students. I tell my students go out there and, and make big moves and, right. and, and I promote entrepreneurship and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of, I have to, I have to try to try and model that. You know? Yeah, this is why I wanted to have you on the show, man. You are literally you. one of those people who is the definition of practice what you preach. And it is something so, so refreshing. You don't reverberate information. You have your own thoughts, your own critical thought on literally anything I ask you. It's not the same answer as I've gotten from anybody else. You are incredibly well read into what you're teaching. And this is why people are going to absorb it. And you're also incredibly compassionate, but not from a toxic level from a, sometimes people need a hard conversation, yeah. hard questions to promote critical thinking in a way that they've never been asked before. And because of that, the children you come into interaction with and contact with, are going to be better adults, better human beings who are going to have less trauma, who are going to not have to go through the process of finding themselves, you know, mutilating their bodies and coming out the other side to just find out they were gay, you know? So I'm just so, I'm so genuinely, and, and I mean this on the deepest level, very grateful as a parent to know that you're going to be an option there when my son hits a certain age and that this is a platform I can show him and this is something that I can help him. And whether you're teaching just American history or not, these are things he needs to be taught. Because as you teach American history, Canada is wiping our history off the face of the earth. So we have to be doing these things. We have to be showing up for our cultures, our societies, our histories. So we stop repeating these behaviors with social contagions and ideologies and UCLA students who are trans promoting the fucking caliphate. And they need to understand that when you say what you're saying, you should get a one-way ticket the same way Elon Musk says, tell me how long you last in that country because they're going to throw you off a roof the second you walk in. So people don't know what they believe. They don't know why they believe it. And it is about damn time somebody steps up and steps forward. And I'm so grateful it's you, Will. So anytime and anything we can do here and any of the contacts I have, they are yours. You just say when, say how, say when you want to come back. You are welcome here anytime, my friend. Means a lot.
Thank you. It's it's it, you have to understand like it's been a long time to get um to get like people recognizing in any kind of big way uh, what I what I'm trying to do. So like no one talks about education on big platforms. Rogan's never yeah. had a con- uh, and I love Joe Rogan, but like he's never had a, a, an educator on. And I get why because <laughs> most of us suck, and I get it. And I'm not saying that I'm the only one. But um, but there, there, it's it's rarer than it should be, and I'm hoping that yeah. I can blaze a trail for others to speak up and then maybe build their own platform too. And and, and mine's not gonna be for everybody, um, but it's it's gonna be for some people. Um, so that really means a lot. Truly, thank you. No, I mean it in the deepest sense. I don't give that offer to everyone. I only give it to people who I see who are genuinely changing the world. And I don't say try because you're not trying to do something; you're doing it. It's radically different. Yeah. Not trying. I'm, well, okay. Yeah. No. Nope. Stop trying it. and start doing. Yoda. Thank you. I got you. Yeah. Exactly. I really okay, can you tell? You on. Yeah. No, man. You're. I mean that. I'm gonna. I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. That's gonna yeah. be fun. Let's Even if it. I get, we get a coffee or dinner, whatever. Oh, I'm super stoked to see you. Um, and then can you tell where all of our listeners can support you? get on the um, pattern docs, how they can get their children involved, how they can yeah. show them and even just couple that with their already educational backgrounds and their schooling yeah. and just give them another resource. Yeah. So um, just my name, Will Roosh is, is on Instagram and I put stuff up there all the time to spark thought. And sometimes I like, you know, I, I take a dump on the left and on the right, just cause I'm kind of politically homeless. Um, <laughs> pattern docs, P A T T E R D O X. Um, uh, is going to be the platform so patterdocs.com and it's new now. So like I'm, I'm filling up the library, but it's new. So if you kind of get in early, you get a lot more attention. Like if, if it's, mm-hmm. if it's the first, like, you know, 25 people, I can spend a lot of time. I can really pour into the kids now it's, it's aimed for teenagers. So it's like middle, middle school, late middle school, all the way through high school. Um, I can really pour into them now. And then if this does scale to where I, when, I'm, I'm hoping it to, yeah, when it when does, like it I really does. believe that I'm going to hire and stuff like that, but, but it's going to, it's going to change. So it's like, it's, better you're going to get more access to me because again this is going to be my full-time thing and i'm going to pour into the to, to, to the people who join it um even this summer for people who whose kids go to regular school i'm or, organizing right now an independent thinker summit which is going to be a whole bunch of people who to, to give your kid tools and skills to resist indoctrination so when they go to school and they're it's trying to push on them whatever the topic is and we're gonna do a whole bunch of different topics controversial topics of just how to think through these things so that they when they do go to school or when they go to college they'll be equipped to be essentially like brainwash proof so i'm gonna be doing that this summer for like a summer program and then roll it into start the official um u.s history uh class and civics i'm gonna be teaching civics at least twice a week um starting in like uh, after labor day you are the reason why i have hope for this next generation my friend Thank you. I'm I'm not, I'm I'm done. I'm going to I'm going to go all in. I'm I burn the boats. I'm doing it. So. Burn the boats, my friend. All right. Yeah. Well, you stick Thank with you. me, Will. We'll put everything in the show notes. The rest of you, we'll see you all next week. Yeah.